Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Damien, the masterpiece by Herman Hess. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, I don't have too many of them, and then I'm going to share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So let's get straight into it. Dane reads... Herman Hesse has become since his death in 1962 one of the most widely read European novelists of this century. His mystical vision has proved prophetic of the questing spirit of the psychedelic generation, to whom he has become a revered figure. In Damien he chronicles with clear-sighted humanity the growth and maturity of Emil Sinclair, who falls under the influence of Max Damien, a strangely self-possessed figure. As Sinclair progresses through orthodox education and philosophical mysticism towards self-awareness, he always has the image of Damien before him, right up to the climactic moment of confrontation with destiny on a blood-drenched battlefield um, and this does what um, uh, Hess does pretty well which is that it, it it kind of follows just like a normal life in a way um, but then it has these sort of I guess like metaphysical and ph philosophical elements to it um, I want to start by checking out this bit from the prologue here which I liked when poets write novels, they are apt to behave as if they were gods, with the power to look beyond and comprehend any human story and serve it up, as if the Almighty himself, omnipresent, were relating it in all its naked truth. That I am, that I am no more able to do than the poets, but my story is more important to me than any poet's story to him, for it is my own, and it is the story of a human being, not an invented, idealised person, but a real, live, unique being. And so Emil pretends that he's stolen something, kind of to impress somebody. Uh, and then he ends up getting blackmailed about it. And I just thought this was really kind of interestingly written. He suddenly left me. Our house passage no longer smelt of peace and safety. The world was tumbling about my ears. He would denounce me as a criminal. They would inform my father. Perhaps the police would come. All the horror of chaos threatened me. The outlook for me was horrible and dangerous. The fact that I had not committed the theft was a mere detail. I had sworn that I had. So why you don't lie, kid? So we get, uh, I had played the man and hero and now I must bear the consequences. I was glad that my father upbraided me about my muddy shoes. It sidestepped the issue, the graver sin passed unnoticed, and I got away with a reproach which I secretly transferred to the other affair. In so doing, a strange new feeling lit up inside me, an unpleasant ruthless feeling full of barbs. I felt superior to my father. For the moment I despised his ignorance, his reprimand about the muddy boots seemed trivial. If you only knew, I thought, and felt like the criminal who is being tried for stealing a loaf of bread when he has confessed to a murder. And so that, for me, this whole scene there, um, is some of the most interesting parts of this book, even though this kind of sets it up so that then Damien shows up and uh, he helps Emil to deal with this kid who's blackmailing him, basically. But actually, that setup I, I felt was almost more interesting than Damien's response to it. And so I thought these couple of paragraphs here were particularly beautiful. Again, I, with, with Hess, I don't know how much to credit him for the writing and how much to credit the translator, but either way, really stunning prose here. I behaved like everybody else. I led the double life of the child who is no longer a child. My conscious self lived in the homely and sanctioned. My conscious self denied the new world that was darkling round me. Side by side with this, however, I lived in dreams, actions, desires of a subterranean kind, over which my conscious life nervously constructed a series of bridges, for my childhood's world was falling apart. Like almost all parents, mine made no attempt to foster the stirring roots of life. No reference was made to them. All they did was to go to endless trouble to bolster my hopeless attempts to deny reality and continue to dwell in a child's world which was becoming more and more unreal and false. It may be that parents cannot do much about it, and I am not trying to reproach mine. It was my own affair to see myself through and find my own way, and like most well brought up children, I managed it badly. Every man goes through this period of crisis. For the average man, it is the point in his life when the demands of his own fate are most at odds with his environment, when the way ahead is most hardly won. For many, it is the only time in their lives when they experience the dying and resurrection, which is our lot, during the decay and slow collapse of childhood, when we are abandoned by everything we love, and suddenly feel the loneliness and deathly cold of the world around us. And a great many people stay forever hanging on to this cliff, and cling desperately their whole life through to the irrevocable past, the dream of the lost paradise, which is the worst and most ruthless of all dreams. That's some powerful shit, mate. We get a cool little translator's note here. Uh, the novel Damien was first published under the pseudonym Emil Sinclair, the name of a friend of the poet Novalis, whom Hess so much admired. And obviously, um, Emil Sinclair is the main character in this. So it's presented, I guess, as, as being factual, not as, not as fiction. And this is like a little, it's kind of a bleak paragraph, but this is sometimes how I look at the world. 
It is impossible to recount briefly what I learned from the eccentric musician about Abraxas. The most important thing was that it meant a step forward in the progress to self-knowledge. I was at that time an unusual youth for my 18 years, precocious in a hundred ways, immature and helpless in a hundred others. When, on occasion, I compared myself with other people, I sometimes felt proud and conceited, but often I was depressed and mortified. I had often regarded myself as a genius, but no less often as half mad. I could not successfully join in the life and pleasures of my fellows, and I had frequently been consumed with self-reproach and anxiety, as if, separated from them, I was beyond hope, as if I was debarred from life. And then we get a reference to people being continent sexually, which, to me, whether you're continent or incontinent means whether you have bladder weakness, like celibacy is is what I think they were talking about. So I don't know whether that's just a change in the way that the the word's been used, or whether that was a translating error, or what it was. And this was fun as well. I mean, the interesting thing about this, because I I don't drink anymore, and I used to drink quite heavily, so I kind of relate to this in some ways. And obviously, I've been a student as well. Full of elation, I retraced my long way back through the now chilly night air. Here and there, noisy students were reeling home through the town. I'd often marked the contrast between their comic kind of merriment and my solitary life, sometimes with scorn, sometimes with a feeling of deprivation. But never until today had I realised with calm and quiet confidence how little it mattered to me and how remote and dead all that world now was for me. I called to mind the civil servants in my own town, worthy old gentlemen who clung to the memories of their drunken university days as if they were memories of a blessed paradise, and upon the vanished freedom of their student years built a cult similar to that which poets or other romantics formerly devoted to childhood. Was it everywhere alike? It was always somewhere in the past that they looked for freedom and happiness, out of sheer dread, lest they should be reminded of their own responsibilities and their own future course. They drank and made merry for a few years, then they crawled into their shells and became serious-minded men in the service of the state. Yes, it was indolence, the spirit of indolence among us, and this student stupidity at least was not so stupid and evil as countless other stupidities. So yeah, all in all, Damien by Herman Hess. Um, again, it's one of those where the plot is kind of secondary to a lot of those sort of philosophical insights that I shared there. I mean, all of those bits that I read out are the bits that obviously spoke most to me, but I think there's something in here that everyone is going to relate to, is going to cause everyone to think about things in some way or other. And it does have a plot as well, it's just like secondary to the purpose of the book I suppose. Um, Damien is an interesting character but I found Emil to be more interesting but I suppose in a way that's kind of inevitable because you you, you experience uh, Damien through Emil's eyes anyway so I think that's part of the reason for that but yes so overall Damien by Herman Hess probably one of my favorite Hesses so far um, I gave this a strong four out of five I'm looking forward to reading more um, do let me know what you think so there we have it, that's what I made of Damien by Herman Hess. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.